this would probably normally be the place where I play my intro, but um, the, 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 that song was just too relaxing to then hit you with that uh, breakbeat intro. Hello, this is Jochen. Welcome to Full Stack Live. I hope you're doing well. Um, it's another Ruby Tuesday, so we are going to do some Ruby coding. I have a few things in mind. There's also a little bit of uh, Vim configuration in there. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to today's stream. I hope you had a great weekend. If you are in the US, you did have a, a longer weekend than um, most of uh, the rest of us. And uh, I hope you had a nice time. I did have a nice time. We um, on on Sunday we uh, went to a forest park where um, there was a um, treetop walk. So they actually built a boardwalk in about ten to twenty meters height, and um, so you could walk among the treetops towards a tower, um, where you then could walk up um, about sixty meters high and. Uh, take a slide down and uh, so uh, my wife and kids um, queued to to take the slide in the end it probably wasn't worth it they queued for more than an hour probably one and a half just to slide down 20 for 20 seconds and uh, all the, uh, all this time I, I was able to walk around and uh, take uh, a look at the scenery and things like that so I I don't think it was worth it and uh, probably uh, and and certainly not on on a Sunday during um, holiday time so uh, yeah it still was nice to, to be out and about in, at, in in the nice weather with the family so um, in the end it was worth it but uh, we probably won't do the slide thing again. Apart from that, it was a pretty relaxed weekend and also a pretty relaxed Monday and, to be honest, a pretty relaxed Tuesday as well. I, um, I'll be honest, I procrastinated a little bit this morning. Um, I didn't get as much work done as I wanted to, but um, at least there's this fixed um, appointment where I probably can't get around doing a little bit of work and if it's just learning a little bit about um, coding proper Ruby code. But let's not make this a complete monologue for two hours. So uh, if there's anything that you'd like to share, pop into chat. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, if you have any feedback. If you want me to explain anything, um, I'll be more than happy to chat. That's great news, uh, by the way, also. Um, we have been mentioned on Ruby Radar, one of the leading Ruby newsletters. And just take a look at that. So um, below their list of interesting Ruby articles, there's a tweet from Andy Culver, then a tweet from Nate Hopkins, um, a uh, an article about Hanami Mastery, and then it's me! It's me! Guys, 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 look, I'm on Ruby Radar. It's so amazing. Probably they wanted to, to me to counterbalance all the awesomeness that is Andrew Culver and Nate Hopkins. Um, uh, but still, anyway, I'm, I'm so psyched that uh, uh, my little uh, live stream uh, got a little bit of recognition. And shout out to um, Andrew and Colin. Um, and thank you for including me in Ruby Radar, a newsletter that's, uh, by the way, pretty amazing. So if you want to uh, be, get up to, uh, or be up to date, then uh, make sure to subscribe to them. And um, below my um, little shout out here, there's um, a new um, NeoVim plugin called Neotest RSpec that immediately, of course, caught my attention. And uh, that's going to be the first thing that we'll try out 
today. Um, over the recent months, I've been building out my NeoVim configuration to be my, as TJ um, calls it, my personal development environment. Not as much an IDE, but definitely um, an environment where I can do proper and uh, efficient coding. So um, I'm more than happy to see that there are uh, test frameworks that uh, actually um, support Ruby coding in NeoVim and make it a little bit easier. Um, with Tmux and um, all my Shelfu, um, it wasn't too bad running uh, tests in, in the shell. But as I uh, realized with lazy Git, having things integrated into your editor and uh, just a keystroke away um, definitely does make things a little bit less, um, uh, less uh, inefficient. Hey Exegete, happy to have you here. I hope you had a great weekend and I hope you're having a great Tuesday as well. Uh, you did a, a nice hike on, on Sunday and of course you had your 4th of July celebrations. Uh, and uh, yeah, good to see that you had a good time. I did not say, oh my shell foo, I said, uh, with my shell foo. Um, so uh, what I meant was that I um, don't find it uh, uh, hard to switch shells in Tmux and, and simply uh, launch something like a, a rake spec or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not going to complain about the complexities of working in the shell. But... Um, I'm curious how much uh, NeoTest RSpec here is going to um, uh, make my my editing on and coding experience a little bit less, uh, a little bit more frictionless. Let's put it that way. So yeah, uh, that's what we're going to do right at the start. So let me see. Um, let's go into my dot files. And uh, so there. Oh, okay. I did make some changes where I added stuff to my um, Vim dictionary for the spell check. So let's uh, add that quickly. Uh, that's uh, nvim at spellings. And uh, let's make sure we got everything. Exegete asks, uh, do you have an on-change script for shell that changed the heck out of my dev feedback loop in Vim? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by on-change script. If you'd like to elaborate, I'm curious what you mean. You mean something that runs every time you make a change to your code? So in, in Ruby, that's would probably be something to do with guard, for example. I had been using guard in the past, um, but I haven't used it in a while, to be honest. Okay, so let's see. Let's go to new test R spec. There we go. So, I guess, we'll need Edvim Neotest. Oh, I see. So, uh, like guard, but uh, shell based. So you can basically connect any command to changes in your local directory. Does make sense. It's probably something that uses the uh, uh, inode notifier 
something like that. Oh, why not take a look? Uh... Wait, what? Just a second. Let's let's get this on the screen. Uh, can I copy? this and put it here so it's an endless loop calling on change then it sleeps for half a second just to not hawk too many resources and uh, it uses the your current working directory and calls has changed. So has changed needs to be um, a command, and it is then it calls changed. Dear, that's that's a little bit too complex for my taste. And changed then. Ooh, okay, so it does an actual find on your current directory. And if anything changes, then it'll trigger a change. Okay. That's a way to do it, but it's uh, pretty inefficient because uh, uh, Linux actually has um, methods built into the kernel that can notify you if anything changes in your current directory. And that's, for example, what Guard uses. Um, and uh, that's much more efficient getting notified by the operating system that something changed instead of um, basically um, have a whole accounting system running that keeps track of files, um, many of which you might not even be interested in, for example, a, a node modules directory or something like that. So um, being able to say, okay, only uh, watch for Ruby files, for example, um, like you do with Guard is much more efficient in terms of operating system resources. So that's why I would probably use uh, Guard instead of something uh, homebrew like this. It's definitely like I would build this myself, so that's it's it's um, I'm, I'm not uh, throwing shade at what Rob built there, but um, knowing that there are more efficient uh, alternatives. Um, I will probably uh, prefer them. And I agree, uh, having pure shell script has its advantages as well. It's easy to understand and you can modify it in, in any way you like. So um, there's definitely uh, pros to, to this approach as well. It's probably just because um, I'm, uh, I've encountered far too many directories that uh, go uh, Mariana Trench deep, and um, having running, uh, being forced to run find on on these, uh, not only is time and resource consuming, it can also uh, throw your file system cache for a loop and things like that. And so, uh, yeah, it's basically my my curse of knowledge kicking in there. Um, that lets me prefer more uh, official ways to do things in, in terms of using the, the kernel inode change notifier. Okay, so let's find out how to um, set this up. So we'll need um, NeoTest because uh, NeoTest RSpec, as the name implies, is based on uh, the NeoTest plugin. So where's my NeoVim configuration? 
Here we go. Uh, where do we... Here's a builds and tests section. So this fits right in here. Uh, no, that's not what I, want, what I meant. Wanted to get this. And then, of course, we'll need the Neotest R spec. Uh, plugin. And we might actually get be able to get rid of Vim test then. I think we'll throw that out. Okay. Do we have anything referencing Vim test? Yeah, we do. And oh, that's something that I just recently added. Maybe I'm not going to throw it out immediately after all. Let's keep it in for the time being. So um, all I need to do is now to call RC up. Not only does it link all my dot files to my home directory, uh, it also um, runs plug install from my Vim instances. Just a second. Oh, okay. There's this high vi whining sound outside and uh, it started uh, um, annoying me, but it's actually my, my daughter uh, hoovering the car, so uh, I'm not going to complain there. And I don't think that the microphone picks it, up, picks it up in the first place. So it's me. It's just me suffering here. Okay, so that's that. Um, question is, how do we call it? There's Lua code. And I guess we need to set it up as well. So we need to call Neotest Setup and configure the Neotest R spec adapter here. Guess that's going to be a new configuration file. So let's go into my Lua user directory and uh, I guess I'll create a new file called testing.lua. I started out um, having plugin specific Lua files like treesitter.lua here, for example, but in the end, um, you always uh, replace plugins with other plugins that have a different name but the same purpose. So um, instead of a Lua line, I might use a different status line uh, plugin so that's why i started using purpose uh named files like status line.lua even though um it'll configure lua line in this case um so i'm not going to call this um neo test lua or something like that but simply testing.lua i guess so let's do that and that way i can always find stuff again but i'm not um forced to um, remove configuration files when I remove a plugin because that's the only downside of the way my dot files are managed. Um, they are basically sim links into my dot files um, repository. So if I remove a file, there's still a sim link pointing to the now uh, non-existent file. Uh, in my dot files repository and I'll have to remove them manually to uh, avoid error messages 
And um, by simply having a testing.lua file, even though um, I might replace NeoTest in the future, uh, the configuration file can still stay and then take care of whatever plugin I'm, plugin I'm using in the future. So that's that. And I guess all we need to do is to um, require a NeoTest and then configure its adapters. We might have to do a few more things and I'll have to look that up. But that's that. Um, I have a nifty little way of uh, initializing um, plugins and making sure they actually exist. Uh, I've stolen that from YouTuber Chris Hat Machine. Uh, so I'll use that. We'll require uh, NeoTest. But if that is not possible because the plugin is not yet installed, for example, so if I pro uh, update my dot files on a different machine where I haven't yet run plug install, um, the NeoTest plugin will not um, be available. And uh, if I simply use this syntax here, require neotest.setup, and um, I can't require NeoTest, then the setup call will uh, fail and um, by First, making sure that there is an opportunity to, uh, there is, that it's possible to even require NeoTest. Um, otherwise, just returning from this configuration file is a little bit more um, defensive and uh, we can uh, catch this issue. We'll just uh, not have the functionality available. So we can simply replace that with uh, NeoTest.setup because that's the local variable that I'm creating up there. And uh, so that's the most basic setup for NeoTest RSpec. Uh, since I haven't been using NeoTest yet, um, I guess I better make sure that uh, I don't need anything else. So let's see. Uh, Neotest uses plenary and Vim. I'm already using plenary. Actually, I'm actually. I think it's even uh, getting included uh, right above that. No, but there is plenary somewhere around here. Where does it get included? Here in the fuzzy finder section. So that's definitely taken care of. And uh, apart from that, we need tree scissor. We do have that as well. And we apparently need to include fix cursor hold before we can use that. Neotest uses the cursor hold event, which has issues in NeoVim. Uh, so we'll include that right in front of uh, NeoTest. So let's run RC up a second time. We didn't create a new dot file, but uh, we need to install the plugin. That's that. And uh, so everything we need to, yeah, there's even a mention of NeoTest RSpec. And here we have a full setup section, adapters, yeah, looks like what we have is already sufficient, nice. And then, if everything is set up correctly, we can run the whole test suite by calling require new test run run path to root project. And yes, we'll use a vim dot function get current working directory. So that'll run the test suite for the current 
working directory. Um, which means if I go into a different project, let's say we're going into 10x. Let's create a new Tmux session for that. And uh, if I try and do this, let's see what happens. Nothing. Okay. That's not enough. So there's no way to... Apparently we can't run Neotest? Does this work require Neotest? Uh, do we use print here? No? Um... Is it echo? No. I remember. Okay, it's uh, echo is the vim command. But if I want to use uh, Lua. Star spec is installed. Neo test is installed too, so that's taken care of. So why can't I run this? Attempt to index field run a nil value. So I guess. It's the second run that doesn't work. Strange. Okay. Let's go back a step. If we want to run, run the nearest test or run the current file, Let's try this. Our problem might be more basic because it doesn't look like we can actually even uh, invoke Neotest, but uh, I'll get to the bottom of that. So let's go into here. It's a very basic uh, test file, but still. Um, we'll have to Use Lua, require new test, run, run. No, we can't call run. Why would that be? Attempt to index field, run a nil value. the feeling that I'm making some basic mistake without noticing it. So what I'm going to do is um, try a different approach. I'll have to integrate it in with uh, command uh, with the keyboard shortcuts anyway. So um, let's go back to our dot files. 
and into key maps. We already have a testing um, definition here where I can uh, press the leader key, which is in my case the space bar, and then T, and uh, this this get this will get me into the test section. So I guess we'll. Um, Mm. I guess we'll sh we should simply add a new key binding here. So I'll use R two call Lua. And then this command. And we'll call this our spec. Um, since NeoTest seems to be able to identify which tests to run, actually, we'll make this the F command. So we might be able to get rid of um, the... Uh, other test plugin after all if NeoTest can stand this test so I guess we'll make this the file key binding Actually, I don't see how this will work any work will work any better than what I did manually before. But uh, still, so let's go back to our ten eggs here. Start NeoVim from scratch. Get my test, and then we'll call T F, and yeah, of course, the same error message. Okay, back to the drawing board. If we want to use Wim plug, uh, we have to include plenary. Maybe I do I have to install plenary before it? That shouldn't make any difference, should it? And that's that. To get started, you will also... Oh, of course, yeah. Of course, adding a configuration file alone doesn't cut it. We are not working in Rails here where every file that you add to your directory gets included automatically. So uh, since we created this new testing.lua file, we actually need to include that. Um, and I guess I'll steal this line here and add it here. And then we'll use um, no uh, user dot testing to actually read this configuration file that sets up NeoTest. And uh, that should do the trick. And let's make this more generic here. So that's that. Uh, keep this configuration for at least for a few more minutes. And uh, then we'll see if NeoTest is going to replace what we have so far. Um, back to 10x. Let's restart NeoVim. Now NeoTest should be um, included. And let's get a spec here. TF. And yes, ooh, that looks nice. You get these nice little check marks next to your tests, both the test example and the whole test section. Ooh, I do like that. 
Um, we have a few more more complicated files, so let's run this. Nice, so I get the check mark next to each example if it works. And uh, then if all the examples are successful, the whole section here gets checked off as well. Without getting a lot of output, so it all happens in the background. I do like that, doesn't overload me with, with stuff. However, what happens if things don't work? So, um, for example, if we change this test from to be true into not to be true and force it to fail, what happens now? Ooh. What do you think? Is this amazing? I think it is. So, let's see. This example didn't work so it gets the, the the cross which means the whole section was not successful which gets it the cross as well and i get the failure message alone without all the output that's much better than what i had before where you simply get the raw rspec output in a in a floating window Yes, friends, I think we've found our new RSpec integration for NeoVim. Okay. So let's fix this test again and let's make sure it is successful. Yeah, nice. Guess that's, that settles it. We'll throw out this part. And we'll throw out the Vim test plugin. So that's that. Let's make sure things still work. And we need to uh, get ourselves the command for the whole test suite so that's going to be here no in key bindings where is that key maps so s we'll get something like Test suite require. So that's that. Here, restart Vim, and I should be able to run TS to run the whole test suite. Not an editor command. Yeah, I think I left out the Lua command. Yes, I did. So that's that. Everything happens in the background, I guess. So, if I load, say, the plan command handler here. Oh, already got the check marks because it ran the host. Oh, that's nice. So, if even if I run the whole test suite, uh, I don't get any output. But once I enter a test file, I'll get the test check marks. I love that. Nice. Okay. Sold. So let's go ahead and commit this. 
Mm-hmm. So instead of Vim test, we're going to use Neo test now. And Vim use Neo test instead of Vim test. Vim dash test. And synced to my dot files. It is super fancy, isn't it? What do you mean by the sweets that matter? We haven't made any changes here. Okay. So let me also jump to Twitchbot, create a new Tmux session. And there is actually a change lying around. So that's okay. Yeah, I can see why. Mm hmm. I've already made some preparations for what I'm going to do today. So that'll lead us to our next section in this stream. Um, something that I realized. When I refactored my 10 eggs bot for the stream um, using this command handler class I had to repeatedly make changes to my uh, original handler so let's switch to 10 x so I can explain what I mean uh, I have these different uh, command handlers here uh, how does this work yeah there in lib10x here. So let's see the, the um, say the plan command handler that I use to uh, that I use to uh, inform you go you guys of my current plans. Um, I realized that I instead of using the raw event handler and uh, having a lot of uh, boilerplate code to implement my command that I realized that I in in the twitch bot um, framework I already had this command handler class based on event handler that is already built to handle commands which means um, chat messages that start with an exclamation mark and um, I uh, chose to update all my commands to use this class. And as you can see, the public part of this interface is just the constructor where I call the base classes constructor by using super and then calling command alias to set up the keywords this command handler will re respond to. In this case, it'll respond to two aliases, uh, namely plan and project. So regardless if you enter exclamation mark plan or if you enter exclamation mark project, you'll get the same result. And uh, that's nice. Uh, everything else here is uh, implementation of this command and it's in the private section. So that's uh, uh, very nice from a design standpoint. But um, having to do that across all my command handlers here, as you can see, they all have the same structure. They need to have um, a constructor and um, they also need to have a constructor with this particular signature. I left out these arguments uh, at first and ran into lots of test breakage, which means, um, yeah, um, I had to repeat this these um, arguments all over again, um, not because I even use them in my um, code here, but because the base class requires them. So that's one thing. And then uh, I always had to make sure that I call super so the base class initialization happens. 
and the only specific thing I have to do for this particular class is then call command alias to define my keyword. And while this works, it's um, not ideal in uh, terms of uh, object-oriented design because, um, as I found out by uh, lots of uh, breaking tests, um, the developer needs to be aware of this uh, constructor signature with these two arguments, whatever they mean, and uh, they need to make sure to call super so the uh, all the initial initialization that's necessary for the event handler class, which is the base class of my command handler class, uh, happens. And requiring the developer to know all these things and to not make mistakes, for example, by leaving out the super call, um, isn't ideal. So what I'm going to do today is to actually refactor that. And uh, Sandy, Sandy Metz uh, actually has a section in uh, her book, uh, Practical Object Oriented Design, um, where she talks about this, where uh, forcing your developers to call super um, is not ideal. And uh, it's better to find ways to actually um, avoid that. And for, uh, luckily, there is a way. Um, and I had actually implemented that before I started relying on this uh, command handler class. Uh, um, and uh, that's how I'm going to refactor this command handler class now. Which means um, I'll have to make an entry in my change log that we are going to do a breaking change. The interface of the command handler class is going to change. Uh, and even though I'm pretty sure that I'm the only user of the Twitch bot Chem, um, I'll uh, try and do do it properly by um, actually releasing a breaking change, which means a, a major version jump. And uh, in this case, uh, I've already written a message refactor command handler, so it doesn't require complex constructors in child classes. Um, and uh, the, the basic knowledge that's required for that. Um, that's something that we can avoid um, having to document extensively. And uh, which means we'll also have to push our version from 506 to 600. That's that. And uh, I think I just made a change to the readme. I can't even remember what the change of the readme was, though. So, uh, yeah, we'll see it when we commit this stuff. Now, how can we avoid forcing our developer to build their own constructor in a specific way that they need to know about and can't deviate from. Well, we'll simply um, throw out this constructor. So I'd like to get rid of this constructor altogether. And uh, fortunately, and that's one of the things that I really like Ruby 4, that's pretty easy because all we do in our constructor here is initialize the command aliases instance variable. We initialize it as an empty array. And of course, we need to have some kind of a replacement for that. And the nice thing that I was referring to is that we've actually declared it an attribute and that meant that we can actually reference it as a bare, bare word. We don't have to use the at syntax to um, actually directly address an instance variable. Uh, since we have a getter method generated automatically by the at reader call down here, um, we can already use command aliases as a bare word, which means as a method call. It's actually a method call now. And since all the uses of command aliases are actually already method calls, we can make command aliases a first class me uh, method by um, simply
throwing the initializer out completely. So um, any call to the constructor will automatically call the uh, constructor of the base class, which is event handler. Um, we don't need any initialization of any instance variable anymore because there's no instance variable in the first place. It's turned into a method. So we can get rid of the adder reader call down here as well. And uh, we can actually get rid of the command alias method. Um, so that vanishes from the public interface. And uh, call can actually be a private method. So that's that. And that should do this, which means the interface has changed. Um, instead of um, overwriting the constructor, the initialize method, where we have to call super, and then we can use command alias to define our keywords, we simply override the command aliases method by returning an array of keywords. And um, that's easy to do and it's clear. And um, all we need to know is that um, we'll have to return an array of strings. Instead of knowing, okay, you have to create your constructor with these two arguments and uh, please, please make sure to call super, otherwise everything will break. Um, now we just override the command aliases method, return um, an array of keywords, and uh, that's it. Things have become much more clear here and much easier to maintain as well. And I guess much easier to read. So that's that. Um, let's run our test suite. TS. Nothing happens, which means our test suite seems to be okay, but since I'm still not used to it, let's really make sure that these things actually work. So there's a command handler spec. Oh, and look at that. There's actual breakage, but there wasn't a pop-up. Uh, the only thing that I should have noticed was down here that there are diagnostics up, but I don't know if that actually appears by itself or only if I have the related file open. So that's something that I need to get used to. Um, or I should look up how NeoTest actually works in terms of uh, running a whole test suite and displaying error messages. So it does not respond to a known command. Yes, it doesn't. Because we need to actually restructure our test here. Um, configuration and client is just plumbing. Here we create a message for the my command. And here we call handler command alias, uh, which we can't anymore. Uh, we create a new handler. I guess we could either monkey patch a command aliases method in there or rather I guess we mock this and say allow handler to receive uh, command aliases and return an array with our command keywords with which in this case is my command and if i run this file it still doesn't work private method call called oh and that's why call is a public a public method just so we can call it in our test i don't like when that's necessary, but I guess I'll keep it 
for the time being. I'll make a, um, a note, though. Fix me. Um, public only for testing. Does this have to be public only for testing? Yeah, something like that. So let's go back here. Test suite. Still fails. Test file. No, it's green. Okay. TS. TS doesn't seem to be working as you'd like it to. T. S. Hmm. Strange. Okay. Anyway. Oh, see, there's additional breakage, because uh, we don't have any Redis running locally, which is required for this. Okay, so we can simply run DC up here to run a Redis um, container. Does this fix our tests? Yes, it does. Okay, maybe it's this uh, Redis failure that somehow interferes with near test RSpec. I'll have to dive deeper into that. But the change that you wanted to do does work. And that means we can actually release a new version of our gem here. So um, let's uh, commit our change. Uh, that's... Uh A fix, but it's a, a breaking change. So I'll use the exclamation mark here in my conventional commit messages. Um, simplify. Command handler usage. Let's push this. And uh, we can uh, rake release to actually push this to Ruby gems. We need two factor authentication here. Copy one time password. That's that. It'll take a few minutes for RubyGems to actually incorporate this version. And in the meantime, we'll switch to 10 eggs and make the necessary changes. So we'll have to um, change our gem file. We'll use TwitchBot 6. And uh, just to illustrate how the change in the TwitchBot framework now simplified our coding of uh, command handlers, we can simply get rid of this initializer and just define a command aliases method with no parameters where we simply return an array with our keywords. There's no super call involved and no argument list that we need to uh, accept, even though we, we don't do anything with them. So we can get rid of this initializer completely. And um, that's it. So the recipe for creating a new command in this uh, Twitch bot framework is now 
define a command aliases method that um, returns the list of commands it should respond to and then um, implement the handle command method. And that's it. So the same goes for our defend command handler, def command aliases, no argument, and we'll simply return defend or defends. And that's that. Oops. The plan command handler works the same way. First, we define command aliases, return plan or project. Quote command. Oops, I don't want, want too many. Uh, oh, yeah. And two more the shout out handler. No, oh, shout out handler is not a command. The streamer command handler will be the last one. Command aliases. And now that's the streamer command. Okay, by now RubyGems should have uh, made version 6 of our Twitch bot framework available. Let's see if that's actually the case. Bundle install. Yeah, here we go. Twitch bot 6.0. Which means we should be able to run our tests as well. And everything seems to be still working. Okay, uh, which means we'll simply commit this as uh, that's basically a chore, I guess. Um, use new command handler interface. And push. In a few seconds, uh, 10x should restart with a ready message. And uh, then the plan command, for example, should still work. Here we go. Let's see. Does work. So that's how you can refactor a class interface to make things easier for the users of your classes and make inheritance a little bit more frictionless. Nice. And that's a good uh, point in time to take a short break. I'll be right back.
You can still hear the Hoover going outside my window here, or for the uh, US-based people, the, the vacuum. So my daughter is still busy cleaning out the car. I'm really curious to see how, um, how she'll behave next time we take a hike or go to the woods. Um, if she welcome new dirt as an opportunity to <laughs> raise her allowance a little bit, or if uh, she'll actually have an appreciation of how much work it is to get this car cleaned again. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm very curious to see how it'll turn out. If you have kids, how do you deal with these things? I'd be interested in uh, how you um, get your kids to help in the household and getting things done like cleaning the car, which most of the time is dirty because of the kids. Um, and uh, them not being too cautious about carrying dirt into the house or into the car. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is to find out why my new test runner in NeoVim didn't do the greatest job in uh, running my test suite and making me uh, interest, uh, making me aware of issues. Okay, Exegete um, at three, that's probably not an issue yet. Yep. On the other hand, at three, I think uh, kids tend to not make too much of a mess, uh, at least in the car, if you don't let them eat in the car. Um, at that age, we probably would have taken off their shoes simply before letting them climb into the car. Because of that, there's no helping... Um, their shoes uh, picking up dirt and th that's definitely not something I would blame them for and if they don't have shoes they can't have dirt on their shoes and they can't wipe their shoes on the back of the driver's seat as well so as I can see Neotest um actually advertises there being a sidebar listing all the tests with their results. That's something that I would be heavily interested in, because that, of course, tells you that something is broken. On the other hand, here in the usage section, there is no um, mention of running a whole test suite. Um, that might be depend on the test adapter so um, maybe that's the reason why the NeoTest RSpec doesn't do what I expect it to okay there is a NeoTest.output method maybe you should take a look at that Displays output of tests, displays per test output. And then there's this summary win window. Okay, that's what I'm interested in, the summary window. Provides mappings for running, attaching, stopping, and showing output. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, I think since they simply refer to the help. Let's find out. Neotest summary. A 
consumer that displays the structure of the test suite along with uh, results and allows running tests. Okay. So there is a summary open call that opens the summary window. We can even toggle it, which probably would be nice. Okay. I can imagine binding that to TW, the test window. And then you can mark, mark positions and run them. Ooh, that's nice too. And then you can uh, pass in arguments, I guess that's not necessary though. Okay. So let's try this manually first. Uh, require new test summary open. Mm. Let's go down here. New, new test summary dot open. Okay, that does work. And if I call run test suite now, oof, it says zero examples, zero failures. Even though the whole window here is red, interesting. So we would say summary run marked. Okay. So how about we mark this? How do I even mark something? Do I press enter? No, that's just folding. Is it M? Mm, looks like it. So if I run summary run marked, yeah, okay. Seems to run them and then fail somehow. Is this specific to this particular code base though? So let's find out by switching to our 10x here and uh, I guess it's toggle some summary summary toggle summary dot toggle no well oh, it's not print okay new test summary toggle yeah here we go and then there's simply the spec. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm And if we then say summary, what was it? Run marked. In this case, nothing was marked. Uh, let's, so let's try and mark spec. This time it ran tests and uh, they were actually successful. It took a little and then they all came back green as expected. So that would probably be the um, result I would expect, especially when I run um, TS. Yep. So as you can see, I, I run space TS to run my test suite. The summary does react and I get green results back. So why doesn't it work for my framework here? Um, maybe the answer is um, there's something broken with it. No. So if I run the test suite here, it 
switches just for a very short time and then it breaks. So it looks like something... was broken. So let's find out if a Neotest does and have anything that can help us to find out what's uh, not working here. Maybe even go here and run this file. Interesting. Somehow, command handler spec doesn't know about the Twitch bot command handler class. And that's why all these tests fail. So I guess that's because this is a gem and the 10x repository is not a gem. That's just a Ruby application. And I think that's because we are outside the directory. Uh, somehow I got, I changed my current working directory. Let's see if this changes things. Uh, so, interesting. Why? And I guess that's because of the help file, huh? Let's close the help window here. Wait, where, where are we? Yeah. Let's close this. Let's go up here. That's this test suite. Ah, look at that. If I go here and run marked, for which we need to define a keyboard shortcut. That still doesn't work. Okay. Let's try and unmark this and maybe just mark this file. That still doesn't work. And TF running the single file also doesn't work. Uninitialized constant twitch bot command handler. Hmm. So for some reason, the environment in which this test is running seems to be different from when I run it from the, from the shell. That's strange. Okay, one step, one step at a time. So let's uh, go into our dot files and um, we'll change the command to A for all, which then frees up the S for the summary. which means we can call summary ogle. And then we'll use R to run the marked files. Well, maybe we'll use M then, I guess. Or file marked. Yeah, and for marked, we need the summary. That does make sense. 
So let's go back to our Twitch bot repository. Relaunch Vim. Let's open up one of these files. Command handler spec. I should be able to get the summary with TS. Yep. And then I should be able to run TA for all. Aha, and look at that. That actually works. Maybe all I needed to do was the to restart Vim, huh? So with TS, I can get rid of that. Nice. Yoda Droid, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Full Stack Live. Good to have you here. How you doing? How is this Tuesday treating you? So that's nice. I can also run this file separately. Yeah. Okay. Now let's try and uh, recreate the situation we had before when I uh, went and uh, uh, moved the command handler's call method into the private section. So let's run a TA again. Okay, I can't see the results, so I would have to open up um, the summary. And then I'll see, okay, down here there's an issue. I'll open that up. And if I do diagnostics show, it says private method call called. And uh, we can't do that, of course, because it's a pri private method. Okay. I think I can work with that. Two XXXY, welcome to the stack. I appreciate your follow. Okay. Yeah, that's that's fine with me. So we can fold this away. And mm -hmm. so let's go back and uh, undo this. Then uh, we'll get the test summary back. Run all tests. Everything is green. I do like the test. Once you are used to it and have defined your basic key bindings, it seems to be pretty useful. So let's go ahead and uh Publish our latest changes. All key mapping, so NVIM. Mm. Redefine NeoTest key binds. Push. That's it. If you want to see my changes, just check out my dot .files repository. And that's that. nice okay folks I still have about half an hour left uh, in terms of time I've scheduled for this stream however I don't feel like starting another task I won't probably I probably won't be able to finish that in time and uh I'm pretty happy with what I've achieved by now. 
So is there anything that you'd like to chat about? Last time we chatted about uh, Copilot. And uh, if if my t-shirt meant that I uh, I work for Pornhub, which I don't, but which would probably be pretty interesting, even from a technical standpoint. So if there's any question you have, if there's any th feedback you have, if you'd like to discuss uh, why I'm using NeoVim, Thoughts on dev containers. That's a pretty generic question. Uh, you, if you like, you can uh, uh, add a little bit to be more specific. But uh, in general, I'm pretty happy using dev containers. So. <laughs> During my, my uh, uh, break earlier, I actually set up uh, my Tmux session for my Ruby on Rails dashboard project, um, just in case I wanted to continue working in there, which I don't, um, but just in case I set it up. And um, I have my uh, Tmuxinator config, which is also part of my dot .files. Um, automatically start all my development containers that I need for this particular project. And um, I'm pretty happy how things work. On, let's uh, take a look at the uh, downsides first. So what I do actually have to do is to use a helper command like here ABE to run um, coding tasks like rake tests, for example. Um, because, uh, yeah, they need to run inside the application container. Um, so I just created myself a few little um, commands that have the necessary docker compose commands, in this case combined with bundle exec, um, to run stuff inside my application container. That's the only downside though. Um, the uh, Huge upside is that everything is, as the name implies, self-contained in these containers. And um, it doesn't matter how many um, auxiliary services this application needs. Um, in this case, um, it does need quite a few. Let's take a look at our Docker Compose file. So as you can see, there's of course the application container. Um, that runs my Ruby on Rails application, but there's also the Postgres container that has the database. We also need Redis for feature flags. And I might actually be able to get rid of that in the future when we switch from rollout to um, uh, what it's called. Um, I can't remember the name of the gem that not only offers a feature flag library. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, not only it's a feature flag libraries, it even uh, offers a cloud-based um, UI where you can actually manage all your feature flag conditions and things like that. I can't think of the name of it. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that uh, Redis database is only necessary for the rollout feature flag library. And then we need an instance of a chef server because our hosting dashboard directly talks to our infrastructure configuration management. So um, having all that stuff running directly on my machine would, of course, be um, uh, possible, especially now that I've switched from Mac to Linux, where I could run all these services natively. But um, having them self-contained with their own volumes, for example, uh, where the data is uh, contained and isolated from other um, projects that might also use Redis or a Postgres database. For example, my, my chatbot here, uh, on which I was um, working earlier, um, uses Redis as well. So we can have completely different Redis databases and setups, things like that. So um, my general view on, on uh, dev containers is very positive. Um, you get a lot 
of uh, uh, comfort and uh, convenience um, out of that. Specifically, the dev container's protocol from VS Code and its CLI variant. Let's take a look. I do know the dev container um, feature that uh, Ruby mine uses, and that's what inspired me actually to um, run my stuff in, in containers. But um, let's take a look at the VS Code implementation here. I guess we don't need NeoTest anymore here, so let's just open this up. Okay, reject. Um, development container CLI. Uh, maybe. When we refer to a command line interface for development containers, there are two varieties dev container CLI, a reference implementation. For the open dev container specification, the current proposal is to make CLI available, then can take a dev container to JSON and create and configure a development container from it. Okay, interesting. So there's an abstraction, I guess, um, where you don't have to write your own Docker Compose file and things like that. You just define a dev container to JSON, more or less on the um, coding level and uh, it'll create your container setup for you. Okay, uh, that's, that's sensible, I guess. And that's actually, actually, I think that's uh, what inspired me to actually use the .dev container directory here. Uh, however, I still have a Docker file in here and not a JSON definition that's a little bit more abstract. So let's take a look at the Rails dev container that you linked to. How does this look in practice? So there is still a Docker file, but also a dev container.json. And how does this look like? Oh, I think that's the same thing that RubyMine uses as well. I just didn't uh, go and copy that. So there's name Ruby. And then we can build this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember RubyMine working in the same way. Ruby, RubyMine actually uh, creates this uh, dev container.json for you. Okay, and then uh, after creation, it runs the boot.sh uh, command. Let's take a look at that. Mm hmm. But then, oh, that's interesting. So it runs all these services inside a single container. So the Docker file needs to be pretty complex, doesn't it? Well, yeah, just in terms of uh, the list of packages you need to install. Okay. Well, this approach definitely reduces the amount of um, configuration files, the the, um, the amount of setup you need to do, because uh, it's just a single um, container per project running all the necessary uh, services. Like in this case, it actually runs MyRiaDB, Postgres, and Redis, on top of things like FFmpeg for uh, active storage and, and things like that. Okay. And then it also assumes that all these services actually get started on install, which they do. 
And then it actually... Uh, it cleans up these things. Does a bundle install, yarn install. Removes temp files. Okay. Exegete wrote, I think the important difference is that you're intended to do dev work inside the container rather than mapping in volumes and working on the host. Yeah, and um, in in the case of um, VS Code, that's, of course, easier because of uh, its uh, ability to actually spawn a VS Code server inside the container and then talk to this server from your client application running locally. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do the same, for example, using Vim. Uh, I would not only have to install Vim inside my development container, but also um, set up all my dot files and things like that. And that's uh, not something that I would do because uh, that'll force me to um, invest an immense amount of time into my tooling that I could rather uh, invest into my actually coding. If all you have to do is um, set up a VS Code server inside your container, which then will automate installing all your plugins and things like that, that's fine. That's definitely an efficient way to do things. Um, but uh, if you're not using VS Code or RubyMine, for that matter, um, then I think it'll be much more complex. And yes, uh, you're right, uh, it does install dot .files. That's, for example, also what um, GitHub Codespaces does. Um, you simply point it to your dot .files repository and it sets them up as well. But still, uh, if you get into the details, uh, you'll still be missing a lot of things. Um, so I have a, a whole Obsidian note um, that uh, tells me what I want to have installed on a development machine. And of course, that's much more than simply my um, uh, my uh, dot files and maybe NeoVim. Uh, you'll also have to have things like rip grab and, and all these command line utilities um, that are configured by your dot files. And uh, having to set this up all the time for each and every project, I'm not sure if I would... Well, does that really warrant the, the effort? As I said before, the only price that I have to pay is that I need to use this uh, prefix script ABE to run my commands if I want to run rake test or if I want to run, uh, as I did here, um, bin dev to get um, the uh, Rails server running as well as the um, uh, uh, webpack process that compiles my stuff. Um, if all I have to do is uh, prefix my commands with app, or if I need to have a bundle exec, then it's ABE. Um, I, I'd rather use my familiar host-based installation here. Than doing my whole development inside a container. And that's even a limitation if you are using VS Code, because um, uh, even though VS Code will spawn a terminal inside the container when you uh, open up a terminal window, um, 
your container will still have to have all your familiar command line tools installed, like rip, grab, bat, and all these things. Um, and uh, so on top of installing all your dot files, you would ha also have to have a script that installs all these um, uh, command line utilities. And that's, I guess, where things can get pretty complex because depending on the base container you use, um, that'll be even different uh, package repositories and things like that. So if, uh, uh, for example, you use a an Ubuntu or Debian-based uh, development container, you'd probably have to add PPA URLs for specific packages, for example, to get a more recent Tmux installation than is available from the distribution itself. Um, uh, some other containers will be based on Alpine, where not only the availability of packages is completely different, but also the commands that you need to run in your Docker file to install them. Um, all these things make it really hard to have a repeatable development environment um, that gets automatically created every time you spawn a project and uh, that doesn't require you to uh, do really detailed um, automation to set up all these containers. And so if you if you ask me how much value would you put on one button repeatable cross platform dev environments, um, that's the dream, I guess. Um, being able to simply point a colleague to a, a container and say, just use that. It it will contain everything uh, that we need or that uh, that we need to do pair programming, for example. It'll have all the command line utilities that we're going to need. Uh, it'll have a pre-configured editor and, and things like that. That's that's amazing. And, and that's definitely something um, that has high value in terms of developer productivity. But it's really hard to achieve if you are... Um, if you depend on more than um, an IDE. As I said, um, if you use VS Code, you get the um, working inside the container basically for free because it'll simply install the VS Code um, server inside that. Um, I could do the same basically installing something like NeoVim with my configuration, my dot files. Um, but it's just much more than, than that. And uh, here I have my Linux distribution um, with everything that I need. And once I create a new project, everything will still be available in the same way. Uh, there's the same NeoVim installation with the same plugins and all these things. And um, repeating this kind of setup every time I spawn a development container sounds like a lot of overhead. And with the approach I'm taking here, um, I'm completely free in um, my choice of uh, base container as well. So for my Rails application here, of course I use uh, a Ruby container as my base container. I don't need to use the uh, VS Code container that Microsoft provided. Uh, which might or might not have things that I need. It'll probably um, be missing a lot of things that I really want to have. And um, so I can simply say, okay, <coughs> this application container um, will run a Rails application. So of course I'm going to choose the Ruby base container and simply install things like uh, Yarn and that's it. And everything else will be imported using volumes and that's that. And I actually do appreciate this uh, freedom of choice here. And if I run a different um, project, I might use a minimal Alpine-based container or something else. Um, so I don't have to have a um, common base container that uh, contains everything. Of course, that's possible as well. Um, you could actually maintain your base um, development container image that has everything that you need 
based on a current Debian or Ubuntu maybe, or even as I'm using here on my um, development machine, um, Manjaro uh, or Arch, um, and uh, have everything you need, but um, then suddenly you're the maintainer of a complete development environment. And uh, to be honest, I don't want to be the maintainer of a development environment, not for myself, let alone for my whole team. Um, even though that's an ideal, if someone came and, and would give me that for free, I'd, I'd definitely take it. But um, I don't think the, uh, the you gain as much as you invest. I think the cost is higher than than uh, the uh, the yield. Let me know if you disagree. So just to summarize, I definitely do value development containers because they uh, uh, save me from uh, cluttering my development machine here and having to distinguish between this is the Redis for my Twitch bot and that, that's the Redis for my uh, Rails application and things like that. Um, so Docker definitely makes things easier here, separating stuff and making things uh, throw away um, pieces that I can recreate anytime I want. But um, going as far as making this my actual development environment where everything I need in terms of tooling is included, that's uh, a little bit too far, I think. I simply don't want to spend the time of... Uh, that spend the time that would be necessary to uh, reach this level of automation and uh, sophistication. Maybe my view is colored actually by not having a big team working on projects. So I think you do have a point there. Open source projects that have any number of contributors where you would want to provide them with a consistent development and testing environment. That's the same use case as a uh, a larger company. Where well, you probably would have um, actually people um, tasked with providing these developer toolings. People who actually define um, the tools that you're going to use because uh, they'll, be, they'll be able to support them as well. Um, where you could have people actually maintaining a container image or multiple container images for different kinds of projects. That's what I meant by uh, if someone would give this to me for free. So if I could um, still focus on coding rail Rails instead of building a development environment for Rails because someone else in the company already does that, they um, take... Uh, they have their own repository where I can put, uh, put in uh, issues and feature requests and things like that. And I get um, a Docker image back or a Docker registry that I simply can pull from. Um, I guess that uh, would definitely have some value because uh, in this case, uh, putting in all this effort and cost in the end um, does make sense from an efficiency standpoint because you will speed up uh, not uh, one person's coding speed, but um, whole teams or departments. And uh, so in this case, I guess uh, it would actually make sense.
I guess you'd still have to make a make an executive decision if if it's actually worth it because um, um, in my case we can simply work with uh, what I've built here so once you've cloned this repository there's a readme file that tells you how to set up things um, you'll simply have to install a few things that are uh, necessary to um, install the gems locally and uh, then you'll create your uh, .n file um, and then uh, all you have to do is docker login, docker compose up to start the containers, which will build and uh, launch automatically. And then, uh, as I said, you will still have to use these uh, prefix helper scripts uh, where you call app to run um, uh, shell commands directly, or you can actually use ABE to run uh, Ruby commands that require bundle exec. And that's basically it. Um, once you've read that and internalized um, the prefixes you need to use, um, it's like working locally as well. And uh, it's far less um, involved in uh, providing a development environment that not everyone might like. This is completely editor agnostic, uh, for example. So if a colleague wants to use VS Code, they're free to do so. Um, this is completely independent of the technology you use to uh, edit your code. Um, and um, it's not even actually uh, depending on RBN, even though uh, it's highly recommended to use. Um, because um, all the uh, the uh, uh, more specific Ruby stuff runs in the container anyway, where we don't need um, to distinguish between different uh, Ruby versions. So um, this still has a lot of flexibility, and I think it's pretty much the sweet spot between automation and uh, flexibility. Whereas um, if you would be in a corporate world, well, you might not like it, but uh, people might actually prescribe uh, which applications you're going to use because you'll need a RubyMine license. Everyone will be using RubyMine, for example, which definitely has its upsides. Um, but of course, not everyone will like uh, other people um, telling them which tools to use. But that's a completely different topic. That was an interesting question. Thank you for that, Exegetio. And that also gets us to the end of today's scheduled stream time. I had a blast. Thank you very much for everything. If you want to talk in between streams, which is um, in between today and Friday, um, you can always... Um, Get hold of me um, on Twitter, or even better, on Mastodon. And of course, as always, I'd like to invite everyone to join our DevOps community over on Obsitive.com, where you can either join for free, or if you'd like to support my work financially a little bit, you can also get a paid membership, which will also get you exclusive com uh, content in return. I'll be back on Friday at 2 o'clock Irish time, which is at the moment one o'clock UTC. And uh, until then, take care.